So um, really great to see everyone here on a stormy night. Um, I'm delighted to um, welcome you all to this final installation of our Big Botany Lecture Series. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that uh, Provost Carl Lejoué is here with us tonight. He's a good friend and done many things for the Art Museum and the rest of the university, so thank you, Carl. Um, I also want to begin by saying that we do have an audio looping uh, capacity in this space, so if you uh, are hearing impaired and have the proper uh, hardware, you can turn it on and take advantage of the audio looping system here. Um, so. I'm delighted to introduce our speaker, uh, Timothy Morton, who's Rita Shea Guffey Chair in the English Department at Rice University. In recent years, he has realigned the way that we consider our relationship to the rest of the biomass on this planet. He's uh, challenged us to dispose of the misleading term natural in our ecological thinking, and he has ushered in the concept of the hyperobject as a means of coping with enormous and unfathomable phenomena such as climate change and global warming. In inviting Morton to speak in the context of big botany, we were inspired by the resonance of the books he's authored over the past decade with the complex story of interdependence between animals, including humans, and the plant world. We must constantly remind ourselves that plants are, after the sun, at the base of the food chain as if providing us all with oxygen were not enough. So the books I was thinking of include Ecology, Without Nature, Rethinking Environmental Aesthetics, Hyperobjects, Philosophy and Ecology, After the End of the World, Dark Ecology, For a Logic of Future Coexistence, and Humankind, Solidarity with Non-Human People. Morton has emphasized the role of art as we navigate the murky waters into Earth's future. Hyperobjects is, for example, illustrated with provocative works of art. And in addition, Morton has collaborated with many artists, including rock phenomenon Bjork, composer Jennifer Walsh, visual artist Oliver Eliasson, and uh, Chaim Steinbach, uh, visual artist and director Emilia Scarnulita, and rapper Farrell Williams. He comes to Lawrence having just co-organized an exhibition based on the concept of hyperobjects at Ballroom Marfa, the installation space and art gallery in Marfa, Texas. In addition to the books mentioned above, Morton has authored eight others as well as 200 essays on philosophy, ecology, literature, music, art, architecture, design, and food. In 2014, he was Wellock Lecturer in Theory at the University of California, Irvine. Keep your eyes out for a new film, Living in the Future's Past, directed by Susan Cusera, starring Jeff Bridges and, among others, Tim Morton as himself. Please join me in welcoming Timothy Morton. Oh my gosh, how incredibly sweet of you and how lovely to see you all. Thank you so much for coming and, and I'm very touched to see you. And what you have to realize, if you weren't at the reception earlier, this is my lab, guys, right? Like, I'm the student and you're the teacher, so this is how I get to learn stuff, you know. And, the, and, and here's the excuse I have for, for, for doing that. It's this lecture, which for some reason is called Inside Big Botany. I wonder what it says. Thank you for laughing. Um, <laughs> thank you for laughing again. Um, I should see the garden far better, said Alice to herself, if I could get to the top of that hill. And here's a path that leads straight to it. At least, no, it doesn't do that after going a few yards along the path and turning several sharp corners. But I suppose it will at last. But how curiously it twists. It's more like a corkscrew than a path. Well, this turn goes to the hill, I suppose. No, it doesn't. This goes straight back to the house. Well, then I'll try it the, the other way. And so she did, wandering up and down and trying turn after turn, but always coming back to the house. Do what she would, indeed, once, when she turned a corner rather more quickly than usual, she ran against it before she could stop herself. It's no use talking about it, Alice said, looking up at the house and pretending it was arguing with her. I'm not going in again yet. I know I should have had to get through the looking glass again, back into the old room, and there'd be an end to all my adventures. So, resolutely turning her back upon the house, she set out at once more down the path, determined to keep straight on till she got to the hill. 
For a few minutes all went on well and she was just saying, I really shall do it this time, when the path gave a sudden twist and shook itself, as she described it afterwards, and the next moment she found herself actually walking in at the door. Oh, it's too bad, she cried. I never saw such a house for getting in the way. Never. However, there was the hill full in sight, so there was nothing to be done but start again. This time she came upon a large flower bed with a border of daisies and a willow tree growing in the middle. Oh, tiger lily, said Alice, addressing herself to the one that was waving gracefully about in the wind. I wish you could talk. We can talk, said the tiger lily, when there's anybody worth talking to. Alice was so astonished that she couldn't speak for a minute. It seemed quite to take her breath away. At length, as the tiger lily only went on waving about, she spoke again in a timid voice, almost in a whisper. And, and can all the flowers talk? As well as you can, said the tiger lily, and a great deal louder. There's a whole bunch more of this, which I can read to you later. Let's cut to the chase, shall we? Oh, this is, this is a good bit from the Red Queen. Where do you come from, said the Red Queen, and where are you going? Look up, speak nicely, and don't twiddle your fingers all the time. When I was, as they say, a nipper, I went to Magdalen College, Oxford. Oxford, in general, is a kind of lunatic asylum for clever people. And, and Magdalen College, thank you for laughing, is an extreme example of that. Part of the insanity was the almost hallucinatory literary world that seemed to float around the actuality of the place. After living in the room Oscar Wilde occupied, and now I'm living opposite the, the, the theatre Oscar Wilde spoke in, which is weird and amazing. I lived, and weird synchronicity, yeah? Um, I lived in a house outside of which was the lamppost where Lucy finds Mr. Tumnus in The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. Down a path designed by Joseph Addison was a bridge on which Winnie the Pooh invented poo sticks. Through a door over that bridge is a beautiful garden called Fellows Garden, where Keats wrote Endymion. It's also the garden of talking flowers in Alice Through the Looking Glass. How did I ever get out of there? I love that Fellows Garden, and I love that part of the Alice story. Both seem to present a strangely psychological, or was it topological, problem. You couldn't really leave the college through the garden unless you had a special key. So you had to go back to the main entrance. You were basically inside a circle with one hole in it, but in practice, you never had to notice even the one hole. You could post mail in a letterbox inside the college where there was a shop where you could buy baked beans and wine and stamps and paper and so on. Like I say, it was a lunatic asylum for clever people. In the same way, every attempt to leave the garden of talking flowers by the gate results in Alice coming back to the front door. Her situation doesn't even have a single hole. It's a totally enclosed space, making you think at once of the old medieval and biblical figure of the Hortus Inclusus, the enclosed garden from the Song of Solomon, a bit of the grounds of a stately home where the lady of the house grew herbs and a bit of patriarchal space called the woman's body. Or the universe according to relativity theory, Voyage around it enough and you find yourself coming back to where you set out from because space-time is a substance that just is the universe as such, considered at universe magnitude, if you like. There's nothing outside of it. If you're 2D, a 3D or higher object is like that for you if you're inside of it, like a little squiggle um, being living inside a circle. If you're 3D, a 4D or higher entity such as the universe is like that for you if you're inside of it like a human or a potato. I think about this passage in the Alice stories whenever I think about being in a biosphere, which is equivalent to whenever I think about being an embodied being. I can't achieve escape velocity from it. Of course, I can fly up to space in an accelerating rocket, but even if I do that, I'm still on Earth, and I'm going to use a philosophy word, phenomenologically speaking, because I'm of it. So that if, for example, I join Mr. Elon Musk and set about colonizing Mars, God knows we've made enough of a mess down here, might as well carry on making a mess up there, I will need to recreate something like the biosphere from scratch, so I'm going to have a worse problem, right? There is no way to get out of that garden of flowers. And what do flowers do anyway if not talk? Say it with flowers. Roses are red, violets are blue. Flowers are always talking. Come over here, Mr. B. I want to use you in a weird three-way with another flower. <laughs> when I walk into what in England is called a bluebell wood, part of a forest carpeted with those lovely blue flowers that come from bulbs, 
It's as if I've, I'm confronted by a gigantic bank of television screens, all talking. It's not surprising, in a way, that Namjoon Pike would have made a thing called Television Garden. And now we know that trees communicate with one another. Moreover, they communicate with one another across species. It's noisy out there. And big botany is a thing. A network of trees that talk to one another. A bluebell wood. The totality of all the plant life at all growing in the biosphere. That last one is for definite some kind of a thing that I like to call a hyperobject, an entity so large and so massively distributed in space and time that I can only apprehend pieces of it at once, even with powerful computational devices. It's an honor to have been invited here. Since our topic is big botany, perhaps it's appropriate to land in that capacious topic from the top down, to parachute in from above. In other words, to go from holes to parts rather than the other way around. You really do have to be a holist if you're an ecological philosopher. The trouble is, most of, just for a minute, when I hear the word philosopher, I hear the, word, the, the, the two words absurd clown, just to be <laughs> absolutely honest with you. And um, the other thing that happens is I'm the kind of person who's got this kind of Larry David habit of saying exactly the wrong thing at the very moment when he thinks he's saying exactly the right thing. And furthermore, I seem to be paid the medium-sized bucks for saying really evil stuff. So I'm very sorry in advance for any sort of accidentally or deliberately satanic stuff that comes out. You certainly blame me for all the bad feelings you're having. Um, the trouble with holism is that most forms of it tend to retweet an idea that one doesn't really know how to prove, an idea that I believe is an artifact of a certain kind of violent theism. That is, the whole is always greater than the sum of its parts. You, you say that all the time, right? The parts of a whole are droplets that are swallowed up in it. You don't have to think that hard to realize how problematic this is, to say the least, for thinking about the life forms and the scales, they aren't all neatly lined up, you know, of time and space that are part of ecological awareness, although it's incredibly popular, right? Like Mother Nature and the Gaia concept, they're basically saying that. It's like, well, it doesn't really matter if polar bears go extinct because Gaia or whatever will evolve and other species to take their place, which means that polar bears are just components in a machine. I mean, it's a machine made of grasses and single-celled organisms and stuff, but it's still a really mechanical picture of the universe, and kind of that sucks. What you need to develop, in fact, is a holism in which the whole is always less than the sum of its parts. Different, but not greater. And I can see you deleting that idea, which it always happens when I say it. And I've been saying it now for like a couple of years. It's the same thing, and I, and I do it too. Such a funny thing to say. Since, but it's really, really easy to prove it. Since there's one whole and many parts, the whole is less in this sense. And that's so, so easy to understand. But I can see you busily about to delete this idea because it runs counter to that meme buzzing around in your head about the whole being an ocean and the parts being droplets. It's very easy to think this new holism, which I'm calling implosive holism or subsendence. That's like transcendence, but with a sub, yeah? in which the whole, to use the language, subsends its parts. If a thing is real, it's real in the same way as another thing. That, in part, is the kind of ontology I like to talk about. Ontology being thinking about how things exist, rather than listing what exists, which is what people all too often think my job is. Luckily for you, I'm not the object police, but let's just pretend I know that, for example, a forest is a real thing, right? Let's just pretend for a minute. Seems like intuitive to say that, right? Like a football team is real, right? Forest is real. So a forest is real, a tree is real, there's one forest, there's lots of trees, they're real in the same way, so there's obviously less forest than trees. And now I can see you busily hitting that delete button in your head as this simple idea fails to connect with a theistic meme we've been retweeting for quite some time. Let's take the example of the biosphere. A flower is an expression of the biosphere, but it can't be reduced to just that. A flower is not a drop in that ocean. A flower is also this love note I'm sending to my friend. It's a place for this bee to burrow. It's this thing I'm using as an example of an implosive holism where the whole is always less than the sum of its parts. Now consider global warming, which is the reason why we're here, pretty much. Weather is obviously a symptom of climate. There's no point whatsoever in wondering whether the rain shower that just happened was or wasn't a symptom of that. Everything is, because climate is the higher dimensional thing that is causing the more localized, less complex thing called weather. 
But weather can't be reduced for, to that. It's a bath for these toads. It's this delicious sensation on my arm. Now consider that really big scary beast for which global warming itself is a euphemism, mass extinction. Because of implosive holism, you can't actually see it anywhere. The most colossal, scariest thing on this planet for a life form is weirdly invisible, and scientists themselves resort to the language of specters to talk about how they can detect it. Strange forms of subtle species rarity, for example, have become signals of this mass extinction. It's not like some obviously old, angry white guy emerges out of the random-looking clouds one day and bends down to smite you. And kind of like that's how most eco-people talk. Like, that's not, like, like, I'm trying not to do that. There's no apocalypse, no ripping off of a veil between appearance and reality. This new myriology, this new way of thinking about parts and wholes, begins to make sense of all kinds of stuff. Only consider symbiosis, which is why we have plants at all. And there's a lovely bit on the touchscreen thing up there about, about, about lichen, for example, and algae and all that. Plants have mycorrhizae. They're tiny fungal symbionts that live on the roots and do things like fixing nitrogen. And chloroplasts, anaerobic bacteria with their own DNA hiding from their own catastrophe, the bacteria scene, if you like, the one we're breathing right now so we can be alive, the one called oxygen. Plants are green because of the chloroplasts. The green world you see around you is a signal from the bacteria scene, which started about three billion years ago. Symbiosis of this radical internal kind, the one biology calls endosymbiosis, is very obviously about an uneasy relationship between host and guest. It's a whole that where the parts are more, right? Not a perfect fusion where both entities dissolve into a new being like droplets in an ocean. A single-celled organism, so this is like the history of it, you know, if you read the manual. A single-celled organism accidentally swallows a thing. Boom. Is this thing fatal or not? It might say to itself, have I just swallowed poison? Maybe I'm being poisoned, then, is part of the, I'm going to use the word again, phenomenology of symbiosis, a.k.a. the way symbiosis arises. That's what phenomenology means. How things arise. Right? Like, what's the phenomenology of this lecture? Like, this daft guy comes in and says weird stuff, and you all go, what? And it's in front of this funny, foresty-looking thing from the 70s, and, you know, all that stuff, right? Um, it's not just experience. It's like the whole thing, right? It's like, how do things arise? So I'm trying not to say experience, because it's a bit funny, like it gets you stuck a bit, although it's easier to understand it. The way symbiosis arises, this thing could kill me. Basic narcissism, named after one of the lovely flowers in the fellow's garden, is about incorporating, eating, like you'd be dead if you didn't have it, you know? Um, since the system requirements fluctuate, maybe this really salty snack will be the one that finally gives me a stroke. Some kind of radical uncertainty is wired into the hospitality here, which is why Jacques Derrida calls it hospitality. You see what he did there? Because hostess means friend, and it also means enemy at the same time, yeah? An openness towards a thing that could poison me is why I can eat at all. Once I've figured that out, then I can make like a flower and open to all kinds of things. Ecological ethics and politics, in a way, is just an amplified narcissism that includes more beings. Right? That's the problem. It's not that there's narcissism and non-narcissism. It's that, I might say a Satan thing in a minute, um, that actually it's just that there are narcissisms that are more or less inclusive. And when some people make this gesture of, I'm not that narcissist over there, Egh. they're doing the narcissistic thing. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, the problem is not narcissism, in a way, if, 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 you ever know, if you know someone like that. The problem is the disordered narcissism that isn't that great, right? Anyway, um, amplified narcissism that includes more beings, thus increasing the risk that I might become poisoned, literally or figuratively. Think about the narcissism of a symbiotic being called a narcissus flower, the openness towards the gigantic stream of photons we call the sun. There's one bona fide plant cell in your body, and it's the kind of cell that trees deploy to detect critters such as bark beetles. It's in your ear. It's a kind of solenoid the sort of thing you have in your lawn sprinkler system. When a pressure wave ripples the liquids in your ear, this little cell goes pop and emits a pulse that meets those ripples. The ripples collide, making a pattern. 
an interference pattern. This pattern can now be transduced into electrochemical signals that can be analyzed by your brain as sound. You are hearing this because a plant cell in your ear went pop, just like how a tree detects a bark beetle. The ear is famously always open, unlike the eyes or the mouth or even the nose. The ear, in a way, is a narcissus flower, open to all the phonons in the world, phonon being the vibration equivalent of a photon. You might be poisoned by the things coming into your ears. A loud sound so beautiful that you can't tear your ears away might destroy your eardrum. Or some philosophical sentence some guy said in an art museum might haunt you for years. You can't listen without that possibility. So while technically a lizard or a leaf is a solar panel, it's more accurately a radio telescope. That bluebell wood is a carpet of cosmic ears. And the ear is a mouth open to whatever blank, blank, blank is raining into it. It cannot be closed, as William Blake puts it in a poem that talks the, to the botanical sex and anti-sex poems of his age, cannot be closed to its own destruction. The tiniest sound makes your eardrum vibrate with less amplitude than the diameter of a hydrogen atom. That's pretty much a photon scale, isn't it? So many more low-frequency photons to swallow nowadays, the ones we call heat, thanks to those greenhouse gases. So much poisoned light, so much radiation. The plants can't help it. So much to undergo. Will we die before we get through this really, really not nice track on the LP, or will it grow on us? Will the possibility that things can be different, aka the future, still be available, or will the computational processes we call digestion close that down as we exercise our mammalian options and run after all the food in the world like Pac-Man. The future is plant-like, lizard-like, strangely, strangely for our mammal-centric rushing and gobbling. Maybe walking among the trees is associated with grief because grief is like toxic sunlight or a huge mammal that a python swallowed. It's the noise we make when we have to make like a tree. This mammal-centric thing we call act, as opposed to be or endure, the way we associate the word object with a non-speaking infant suffering. That binary is perhaps enabled by something all that rushing about and gobbling obscures. Something plant-like that the mammalian genome overwrites, something that surfaces in the lizard on the rock in the sunlight. This binary expressed in the still wildly popular Aristotelian difference between animal, something that moves, and vegetable, something that merely grows, is probably exactly not how things are. I like to argue that the subatomic particle of acting is appreciating. An action is made of thousands of little dots of listening. Just talk to anyone who's been in a band. You're listening to the music. You're listening to your instrument. You're attending to your musical lineage. You're waiting for the guitarist to finish the solo. Rushing about and gobbling is made of little dots of big botany. The sexual display of a plant we call flowers aren't directly signaling to other flowers, like great shirts and pants signaling to other mammals wearing shirts and pants. A flower is a risk, a gamble, an open door like an ear the door we call the future. It's not really even waiting for that bee, is it? If by wait is meant something deliberate and active, it's more like just being a shirt or a pair of pants. Without a wearer, just being a shirt hanging in the shop window. The commodified world we float around as bohemian romantic consumers, we all are that by, by now, right? Like, we, know, we didn't dress up in a uniform to do this. We all have, like, have our own style, you know? So we've all turned into De Quincey and Wordsworth and Baudelaire at this point, everyone in this room. I'm very sorry. Did, did you notice? I'm very sorry about it. Um, the commodified world we float around as bohemian romantic consumers at the mall or online is exactly the world of flowers. And this world is, brace for impact, the future. No, I'm not saying that what happens at Top Man is the future of the human species. I'm saying that in a weird way, no one wants to talk about consumerism. It's another Satan thing. Consumerism contains some ecological chemicals, experiential chemicals, if you like, 
though I don't like collapsing what should be called phenomenological chemicals into just an experiencer or a subject or whatever. And that the active ingredient of those chemicals is the weirdly come hither, eat me, drink me, wear me signal coming from those shirts, those flowers. In the broadest sense, art, what does it all mean anyway? We don't know yet is the future, is the future, and the job of the philosopher is to hold the door to the future open, this radical future, this possibility that things can be different at all, which is called futurality, not some predictable future. A bee might show up or not. We're just going to hang around sending out ultraviolet signals, then this thing happens, this symbiotic thing involving insects and birds. For there to be flowers, there have to be beings such as insects. Flowers must come after insects, but in a way, flowers tell you something true about insects and mammals. In a way, the scary, open-mouthed, wide-angle narcissism of a flower tells you something true about acting. Acting is made of little dots of appreciating, as I was saying, which requires hesitating, which requires the possibility of being poisoned. Is this getting surreal enough for you, by the way? So now we can have a little chat about scales. Because ecological awareness, when you think about it, just means being aware that things happen on more than one time and space scale at once, and that these scales aren't in particular useful in whatever way for humans, except in the understanding, reporting, observing, undergoing sort of senses. In fact, they may well inhibit or paralyze us when we become aware of them, though those might not necessarily be bad outcomes. What we're going to say about it is close to the lovely quotation in the catalogue. This one, and, and, and this is another Alice. Did you ever think, Alice said, that maybe trees are alive like we are, only just more slowly? That what a day is to us, maybe a whole summer is to them, between sleep and sleep, you know? That they have long, long thoughts and conversations that are just too slow for us to hear? I think about this a lot because I look after a lizard, a bearded dragon, and like plants, lizards are locked into the movements of the solar system. They are solar panels. So are we, but we're mammals. We can run after our prey and stuff. Lizard and tree temporality is keyed to hyperobjects. There's something planet scale about a single plant or a single lizard basking under a heat lamp in a glass tank in some philosopher's front room in Houston. They're still, according to our temporality, they're static, because they need to be, because they need to be. To see a plant in a pot in your kitchen is to see, and not quite see, the entity called solar system. It's what the plant is referring to beyond the words that are coming out of its petals in a sexual display sense. Referring to, in that Heidegger sense, the sense of how my keyboard is referring to my fingers as I type this, and my fingers refer to my arm, and the arm bone's connected to the shoulder bone, and the shoulder bone's connected to the Lawrence Kansas bone, and the Lawrence Kansas bone's connected to the superfund site bone. It's an astounding, wondrous, possibly scary level jump, isn't it? A metonymy is when you take one causal aspect of a thing and substitute that for the name of the thing. We do it all the time. A casserole is a meal that you make in a casserole. Toast is a thing that you do to bread. Windshield wiper. Or to take another kind of causal relationship, wheels instead of car, threads instead of clothing. Or another kind, the White House instead of the president. So the metonymy for aloe plant in my kitchen is solar system. I watered the solar system before I left for the plane. I let a few droplets fall onto the turgy, spiky green solar system growing humbly next to my kettle. Solar system, pl potted plant, water droplet, electron. Those scale tools in science museums and online give you a tremendous sense of power as you toggle so smoothly between the Planck length and universe scale. The smoothness and power are in inverse proportion to what is in fact the case, namely that humans are now aware of all kinds of entities, these hyperobjects, that are mostly just have to undergo, as I'm saying, endure, observe, and report on, and that they happen so differently on so many different scales that any kind of smooth transition is utterly out of the question. What seems to be the case on one level just isn't the case on another. Here's a really good example that I need to tell you. Um, as an eco guy, right, like 
We may be responsible for whatever this thing is, but we're not guilty. You are not guilty. You're not guilty, okay? You're not. You're not guilty. Because guilt is scaled to individuals, right? Like, when you started your car to come here, you didn't cause global warming. You didn't. You really didn't do that. That's statistically meaningless, right? Billions and billions and billions of those things are sort of doing it, part of doing it, right? So on the one hand, we're sitting in this room, right, and, and, and I'm talking, and on the other hand, we're like this asteroid hurtling towards Earth to, like, wipe the dinosaurs out. And the trouble with people like me is that we make the asteroid more real than the sitting in the room. So, and you'd better like that fact, that you, you're just a droplet in an ocean, right? So you see this thing about the hole is always less? Makes you like a nicer person. Um, but you sound a bit weird if you're talking about eco stuff. Um, boiling, right, is a thing my kettle does that makes sense on my good old human scale. But it means nothing to an electron. On a strange kind of Oprah for subatomic particles, an electron is going, I found myself teleported to a higher orbit. I have no idea why or not. This teleportation is pretty random. The massive time and space scales that hyperobjects occupy imply quite powerful consequences for how to understand them and relate to them. Blown up as if in a gigantic microscope, hyperobjects reveal the paradoxical qualities of things in general, which are well exemplified by what we've been calling big botany and the human place within it. One thing, hyperobjects are everywhere and nowhere. They exemplify how things uh, withdraw, you might say, from direct access, yet manifest all over the place with all kinds of intensities. Big botany gets into language. Human language, in a way, is deeply intertwined with big botany. It's a strange thing, you know, all those poems about flowers. Nothing could be more conventional until you begin to realize that all the poems about flowers are poems about poetry. They're little keys to what the poem is requiring of its poetics, because a flower is a trope, conventionally, you know, like a sort of figure of speechy thing. We talk about flowery language because a trope is the flower of rhetoric. That's why it's called an anthology, by the way. That's a collection of flowers, right? Something similar seems to be going on in Hindu aesthetics, where there are rasas, flavors, which are, in a way, memes, prefabricated strings of language used for different specific purposes. The rasas, by analogy, and this is in the so how they describe themselves, are spices and herbs. They're things you cook with. What is a flower? Some kind of showy display, we assume. The stem is the important thing. After all, if we didn't have stems, we wouldn't have flowers. Really? Are you sure? Just because stems are indeed chronologically prior to flowers doesn't mean they're logically prior to flowers, right? In fact, I think it's quite the reverse. Imagine it. It's sort of like viruses are chronologically after bacteria, but they're telling you something true about bacteria, right? Um, think about it. How come flowers evolved at all? They're really complex. They require all kinds of energy. The sexuality they structure involves multiple species and so on. This brings up a deeper point. Sexual display in general is incredibly expensive from a DNA point of view. There's really very little to explain it if you think that genes are sort of like selfish and utilitarian. Since genetic mutation is random with respect to current need, there's no direction to mutation, even on a mutation by mutation basis. No direction, no telos, as we like to say. A flower is a trope for a deep reason, it turns out. A flower is, in a sense, quite useless. It's not really the case that this uselessness becomes useful when seen at the right scale, so that altruism is really selfishness optimized for long-term stuff. Altruism, the concept, is an artifact of a rigid concept of self that flowers totally defy. Remember the birds and the bees and the pollen? Mutation, and therefore evolution, happen because of a useless excess of appearing, an I-can't-help-it exhibitionism that is hardwired into what it means to be a thing at all. And if you've got five hours, I can actually prove that. Flowers don't just tell you something true about mammals. Flowers tell you something true about photons and Mars and iron railings encircling a graveyard where you were launching a drone. We don't want to know about that sh at, at, at present. Isn't that why we now call some subjects STEM? What an awesome marketing ploy that is, which makes no sense at all. Computation is always based on the past. 
Computation sort of is the past, at least the human thought-flavored past. Reason is from the future. Reason is the future. So we have better have, have ways, so we have better ways of reproducing the past really, really fast, right? Like you've already, cal you, you've already got the data, so data is past tense, right? Then you do these calculations with it, right? And, and we're getting more and more and more of that. And what worries me about the automation is not the artificial intelligence, because God knows I'm probably an android, right? What worries me is the fact that the past is eating the future. Like the more automation we have, the more the past gets to go boom, and then the future sort of disappears, right? We really do have to start getting friendly with our ability to reason rather than our ability to compute. You know, like turning my daughter into a billions of times slower version of this, right? Like 20 years from now, how's that going to help um, her to get a job? We really do have to start getting friendly with our ability to reason, which is really different. Like you would have thought it was the same, but like point to the number one. Right? So, oh, well, that's no, no, you're just pointing to your finger there. Right? Show, show me the number one in this room. You, you, you're going to point to a thing, that's not the number one, right? But the number one is structuring how you do that pointing. You see what I'm saying? So reason is really different, actually, from just computing. Um, get friendly with our ability to reason, which means getting friendly with our ability to imagine, right? Because imagining is how reason kind of feels. You know this kind of trying to potato chip industry phrase, mouthfeel, this horrible PR word they invented, this, this word mouthfeel, like, it's the texture of a thing in your mouth, right? The, it has, the word mouthfeel has really bad mouthfeel, <laughs> think about it. You know? um, so like in a way, imagination is reason feel, right, by analogy, that's sort of what it is, yeah? Um, which means, so, our, so getting friendly with our ability to reason, which means getting friendly with our ability to imagine, which means getting friendly with our powers of visualization. Visualization, the thing that just sort of happens to you as if your mind is growing towards the light. Visualization is more like listening than what is called seeing. The trouble with those scary colossal global warming timescales, the 500, 20,000, and 100,000 year scales are the significant ones for me, isn't that we can't picture them. The trouble is we can picture them. And these pictures just show up like plants and fungi, unbidden. They defeat our ideas of what to do might mean, which is one reason why people like me get that question a lot, namely, what are we to do? It's not really a practical question. It's an existential question disguised as a practical one, because it really means, how on earth are we going to cope now that we know all this? That includes all kinds of doings, such as policy making, of course, but it's bigger than that. It's big botany, a gigantic forest in which little mammals sometimes scurry about thinking that they're doing stuff, which in turn, and this means getting right down to brass tacks, means accepting that hallucinating is a logical possibility condition for thinking. Hallucinating, the thing that just pops up, up in your head, which must be able to pop up in your head for you to visualize, which is already quite a bit more passive than our ideas about act and endure want to cope with. Did you know that the output from the visual center of the brain is far, far in excess of the visual input through our eyes? What if seeing itself, like hearing, were based on the ability to hallucinate? Like that you send out a hallucination and it kind of interferes with the visual input. I don't know, I'm not a scientist. And what in turn, if that power spoke to us about what I like to call now the symbiotic real. I finally found a phrase that worked. I, I don't like to use the word nature. We can talk about that later. But I found this phrase kind of handy, right? Because there is something out there that isn't just us and our projections. It's, and I'm calling it that. The symbiotic real, AKA the theory of human plant coevolution. In other words, what if what was truly scary about our ability to think was that it was an expression of the plant genomes in human brains? What if every thought were actually a kind of flower, part of a plant's sexual display, or at any rate, a byproduct pro uh, product of it? Anyone who can help us decrease the inhibition barrier that blocks our imagining would be good, not because we can't imagine things like global warming and need all kinds of sermons and convincings and guilt-inducings, but because we can. And that in the end, this ability, this precious human ability from which we get words like humanities and all that, is in fact what should most remind us of our tentative symbiotic being. What's the trouble with thinking? 
that it may take you to places you didn't want to go. Why is that? Because it's more like listening than let there be light. And why is that? Because, it's, because a thought, in a way, is a hallucination that you believe in. You accept it, then you can seek out its logical structure. The other ones, the bad ones that you've just labelled, are phantasms. Those are the ones that whisper the truth, that thoughts are not, not, are not dependent on your mind or brain for their existence. They really are much more like memes. So one big hallucination we've accepted as a thought is that thoughts aren't hallucinations, that they are organic parts of your head, indexical signs of mental activity probably thought to be going on inside some kind of container, such as a skull, like a nice flower pot that doesn't have any leaks. It's another one of those explosive holes that's greater than the sum of its parts. On this view, thoughts are droplets in a larger ocean. Thoughts are symptoms of an explosive holism. That is a symptom of a tyrannical theism. The ideologi- that is the ideological support structure, 1.0, sorry, technical language, for the kind of social space that constantly severs its necessarily ongoing connections with non-human beings. On this anthropocentric view, humans are like thoughts. They're definitely not contaminated with beings outside of human social space. Social space is a nice flower pot, and humans and their cattle, such as computers, capital, and moo cows, grow inside of it. Thinking that your head is contaminated with aliens, which happens to be true, especially if you've ever come near a cat, is considered crazy, just as believing in a hallucination, rather than believing in a hallucination that thoughts are not phantasms from the outside, not aliens that contaminate your head, is considered to be crazy. What seems crazy at one scale, believing in a hallucination or an alien from inside the anthropocentric flower pot, is actually how the whole thing functions in a sane way at another scale. Humans are nice, neat beings with nice, neat boundaries, so this goes, and nice, neat thoughts that come from inside of them, it's spatial, extensionally, like, like somewhere like a few inches in here. That idea whose literary analog is the realist character you can really identify with because you can get inside her head. That feeling of real and true coinciding based on an experience of an authentic inside, that idea is the biggest hallucination of all, the hallucination that structures differences between sane and insane, for example. You know, realism is designed to make you have a telepathic experience with a fictional character that isn't real. As if to take revenge, plants grow out of the words we have for that. Dendrite, branching thought, stem, flowery language, radical. That old structural anthropological idea that myths are computations and thus never ending because you can't solve the puzzle concerning whether humans come from themselves or from not themselves. That's the so-called autochthonous and chthonic origins ideas. Has a very simple solution. We come from not ourselves, as every sentence that has considered itself to be scientific for the last 200 years has told us very convincingly. But we still go about wondering whether this or that thing that, or, the, or, the, 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 or the, this or that person did is from nature or from nurture, from outside or from inside of human social space. But the flower pot, which elsewhere I have called agri-logistics, was always a product of a relationship to non-humans. The mild global warming of the Holocene had caused the dinners of humans to migrate elsewhere, and that included the plants, which do move, of course, just differently from animals. And so you you invent things like cities and stuff to cope with that stuff, and then eventually you require industrial processes to cope with the cities, and then you require fossil fuels, dot, 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 global warming. So the really sad, sort of sick joke version of the last 12,000 years, because this happened all around the world, right? Sort of Africa, Mesopotamia, Asia, in the Americas, and the sick joke version is like, in order to avoid mild global warming, humans created really bad global warming. Nietzsche, thank you for slightly uneasily laughing. Nietzsche writes somewhere that a human being resides between a plant and a ghost. He forgot to wonder what kind of plant. Something like some Triassic horsetail that just grows, like the Aristotelian idea of vegetable, or something like a Jurassic plant with flowers, something that already has a kind of face, a sexuality, something that implies a kind of beauty, a non-conceptual appreciation for no reason, if only as a logical possibility condition for sexual reproduction. 
and if only as a thing distributed among birds and bees as well as flowers themselves. But why would that make the beauty less potent or less actual? Kantian beauty, for example, is already distributed between at least two beings, a subject and an object. You can't really blame it on either one. That's the whole brilliance of it. On this view, a plant itself is halfway between a plant and a ghost. And this is the twist we've been talking about all the time. Isn't the Jurassic flower actually telling you something true that you missed about that Triassic one? All the scary so-called passivity of the Triassic one has actually been brought to the surface and amplified by those colorful ears, those shirts without a wearer hanging in the shop window or paintings hanging in an art museum, both behind plate glass designed to produce that weird ontological shift we call aesthetic dimension. It was invented in 1820, roughly, when the word scientist was invented. All flowers are artificial flowers, so to speak, for display purposes only. And this artifice, this tropology, isn't an accidental optional extra painting a brutal lump. It's not something to feel good or evil about, not something exclusively human or especially well done by humans. This artifice, this art, this display. Artifice is exactly how we express the big botanical way the biosphere is. And while a flower is the plot of an algorithm in the plant's genes, and therefore a flower is the past, a flower is also the future, just exactly because of this wear me, eat me, drink me logic. When you look at a flower, you're looking at a train junction where past and future are sliding over one another without touching. You're hesitating. This hesitating, this appreciating, this stillness that isn't the opposite of movement, this quantum of action, this little gateway that is the future, materializing and dematerializing before your eyes, which become like flowers waiting for something or someone as they tune to the hesitant ear of a flower, is what acting is made of. Mammal movements are made of slender, intertwined, fragile plant tendrils. What is it then? with the garden of talking flowers in the Alice story. Why are these beings in particular the ones who occupy that weird folded space where you just keep on coming back to the front door you thought you were leaving? Like, sort of clue, the word ecology comes from the Greek word for house. Is this stuff, is this how stuff actually happens? Is this seeming rotation without going anywhere? this hesitating forced upon a Victorian mammal as she tries to escape the miniaturized biosphere of the garden, this plant mode she discovers to her initial dismay when her actions are seen at the right scale. Is this how change actually feels? Thank you very much. And so, and so, and so very, very obviously, I'm really super happy to take questions. And we, we have microphones that you can use or not. Or If you don't use, I'll just repeat the question. Anyone? <laughs> As I walk up and down through the undergrowth, <laughs> the, the 1978 yeah. undergrowth. But we're recording this, you see. Okay, I, I probably got your phrasing wrong, but I, mm. I was struck by the comment on was it toxic theism. Mm -hmm. you want to elaborate that word? Is yes, that? Yes, sure. Um, okay, so um, one of the very important things for people like me to do, rather than trying to convince you to look at polar bears and stuff, is to like, have a conversation about belief. Because I think that people like me actually tend to believe something much cruder than people who actually admit that they believe something. So before I talk about God or whatever, let's talk about believing and what belief could believe could mean, you know, because the trouble is it really is a belief war. I'm ever so sorry, Richard Dawkins, but when it's done like that in a scientific way with lots of factoids and shouting and you're going to like it, it turns into my belief needs to eat your belief. And belief in that model is holding on super, super, super tight to something and not letting go, right? And so the thing gets stuck. And we need it not to be stuck because we need seven and a half billion people doing this, right? Like, not just some of them, right? Like, we don't need good and evil because good implies not everyone, right? Anyway, 
what if belief was actually more like trusting? Like, instead of holding on really tight, what if, like, for me, belief is more like that, like the Kierkegaard idea, like you're just trusting something, right? That's the first conversation to have, right? Um, the, uh, that kind of clutching on belief mode is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about this theism. I'm not necessarily talking about an entity that we're believing in or not. I'm talking about the way that we're believing. And, like, um, I keep saying this thing to myself, the how is the what. I keep sort of saying it, right? It's, sort of like, it's not like what you think, but how you think that might start World War III, right? Like, and how you think isn't an optional extra, right? Like, since imagination is think-feel in a way, right, um, scientists have a shtick. They have a sort of style. They have a kind of vibe. They're just not really... They, they, they only have one example of it, is the trouble. It's going to have gotten stuck, right? And in my work, I'm trying to provide a kind of suit, a science-y sort of feeling suit that you don't have to know or believe anything to wear. You go, oh, I tried on. You just try on this kind of WTF attitude. It's much nicer than being forced to believe something, I think. Um, so, like, the how is the what, you know? Um, and personally, you know, I think, you know, I, I, I don't want to have that kind of belief, whether it be in a notion of God or Buddha or anything. If it's that kind of believing, right? Like, I'm th then I'm objectifying this thing that I'm believing in, actually. I'm turning it into, like, a, an object in a bad way, and myself. Oh. Go on. Yes, it might. Um, the, the, the question is, doesn't that kind of belief relate to the past? Yeah, I, you know what, I'd never... Th th thank you, see, it's my lab. Because um, the, the concept is that you're holding on to something that's already been established, right? Whereas the trusting is the future, right? Like, if you write books, you've got to go with this trusting thing eventually, which means you have to sort of trust yourself, which means that you have to not care so much what the end of the sentence is going to be, elephant, banana, strawberry, black hole. Hello. <laughs> that ended badly. <laughs> do, you, do you think there's a sort of um, event horizon when mm. people start to take, when humanity starts to take the real possibility of extinction more seriously, and how does that change us and when that happens? Gosh. Um, yeah, yeah, yes. Um, the trouble with that is that when you say, you, we say, I say this word extinction, and it's like I'm sort of, I find it very hard to cope with this word. You know, like I can actually only let it in emotionally for like one second a day, the facts that are happening before I want to curl up in the fetal position and die. And the trouble with being in the fetal position and dying is you're not helping. So like my job is somehow to peel myself off the floor and I do sometimes suffer from depression. So I'm like, I use my own inner space. It's like a kind of chemistry lab to like analyze the emotions, right? Um, and there is such a thing as passed on trauma, people are discovering. And like great grandchildren of Holocaust victims have Holocaust PTSD, right? Therefore, great, 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 great grandchildren of the Mesopotamian type people who started doing this thing called severing our connections with life forms that you can't really sever must be experiencing some kind of trauma, right? Where is this trauma evident in social space? If it's really everywhere, it's got to be kind of old. Right, like where, what, where, where's like the everywhere one? And the most everywhere one I can think of is the concept of child, right, as a being who's still allowed to talk to supposedly inanimate objects like they're conscious and alive. Right, adult is someone who's not allowed to do that. That to me is a symptom of a colossal trauma that we don't even know we have, that's kind of humming away in the background of all the other stupid, horrible things that happened to us, that we kind of did to ourselves, slightly by accident just by trying to be happy. You know, that's the, that's the sad bit. And I think, you know, we, AK, and when I say we in this sentence, I just mean white guys, you know, who was reasonably well off, are beginning to notice what everyone else on the planet probably noticed quite a long time ago. So it's a bit embarrassing. Like, you can only be upset about it to that level for about five seconds. Where everyone's like, come on, you lame-o. Got to get with the program.
around the big botany exhibit, people yeah. have been talking a lot about plant thinking. Yes. And I'm wondering, I'm thinking yeah. about what you said about right. kind of the phenomenology of the plant and what right. it would be like to be in a plant umwelt. Right well, on. you didn't say that, but I'm saying. Um, yes. Do you I think this could point us to a kind of plant ethics right um, that might be a model for us right too? Right or the That's relation? That's exactly what I'm say, say, saying, translated into much more beautiful sentences that everyone can understand. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's like how, how, how to make like a tree, right, literally, and, and not leave because there's nowhere to leave to is literally the point, right? It's sort of like we've forgotten something about how to be that trees and lizards and stuff are sort of showing us, and it's not this completely inert passivity, it's something else, right? And since plants have some kind of sentience, it doesn't depend upon whatever kind of wet stuff is in here, right? Which we know already, right? Like, you can kind of prove it. And like, um, without using any science, you can prove it logically. Um, do, you want, do you want me to do it? Okay. So, in the 19th century, there was this idea called psychologism, which is that logical sentences, like sentences that may mean something, are symptoms of a healthy brain. Spot the problem? Good. So what's a healthy brain? Well, it's a thing that we can analyze using science. And what is science? It's logically arranging data to make sense. And what's logic? It's a symptom of a healthy brain. And what's a healthy brain? It's something we can find out with science. And what's science? It involves logic. And what's logic? It's a symptom of There's a kind of infinite regress. You know that can't be true, right? Like in philosophy space, that means that can't be right. Thoughts and stuff aren't just symptoms of minds or brains. They're more like memes. They have their own independent reality, which is why you can have them when I say them, right? And then the philosopher who figured this out, Husserl, was like, oh, it's not just thought thinking, is it, in that logical way. It's hoping and despairing and wishing and loving, and all those things are also like little fish swimming around in this ocean, you see, right? And so um, that's the way I'm, I'm arguing. Rather than trying to prove that plants can think, I'm proving that thinking is already plant-like. It's like the philosophy way. It's like the cheap way. It's like, instead of trying to prove that ants can imagine stuff, like trying to get a, trying to get a chimpanzee out of a, out of a zoo in, in New York, right? Like this lawyer's trying to do it right now, and they failed. And, you know, because the bar keeps being set really high. Like, does this chimpanzee have a self-concept? Oh, let's find out. Do I have a self-concept? You know, like, do I, like, oh, let's prove that the chimpanzee can imagine things. C can I imagine things? Prove that I can imagine things. That's like the cheap way, where you don't need lots of money. If I can't prove that I can imagine stuff completely, that if, if, if I can't prove that I'm not an android, then kind of I should allow a chimp to be a person, because I'm allowing this thing that could be an android to be a person. And for that matter, I might as well allow like android androids to be people. And now it gets really woo-woo, because I have to allow chairs and like carpets and stuff. And, hairdos to be people as well. And you, you, you don't have to follow me down the rabbit hole that, to that level. Just like realize that you can sort of get a lot from just thinking about stuff. And you don't have to prove that plants can think. All you have to do is like notice that there's something about thinking, these things that pop in up, up in our head that have like a style to them, which I'm calling the tropology, right? But everything has a style to it. There's no flavorless sort of thought. It's really plant-like, right? And it's sort of how to make like that in a big botany sort of a way. Thank you for your talk and thank you for being here. You're welcome. And trying to think about trauma, mm. depression, mm. the Anthropocene. My favorite all, hobby. All of it. Uh, and yeah. yet, we're as humans drawn to plants to help us hallucinate. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 we, we, we smoke yes. them, we eat them, we, we take them as drugs yes. and pharmaceuticals. Right. So yep. yeah. how is our relationship to plants yes. then ethical? I nicked all this from, from Terence McKenna's brother, who made the DMT for Terence McKenna. Dennis McKenna, who works at Illinois Champaign-Urbana, right? And he's got this theory, along with various other people, of human-plant coevolution, right? There is not a single cannabis plant on this planet that well, can't be traced back at some point to some human farmer, and that includes ones in Siberia, right? So one idea is that, like, thinking arose from eating these funny leaves, right? Because you start hallucinating, then you start believing in some of the hallucinations, right? And then, and interestingly, language, right? Like, let, let, let's eat these leaves and jump around, you know? This is like the going, like, Harvard theory of language at this point, you know? Um, and, you know, some chimp is like, make some noise, you know, and, that, and, and that's where language starts in this kind of ritual, 
collective thing. Um, I don't know if it's good or evil. Like, like so the problem with the word drug. Like, we say drugstore. I say we because I'm American now. You know, I've got British American passport. When I go back to England, if I say drugstore in England, it sounds evil. You know, but in it, so, so in England, you, you say chemist's shop. You know, sounds a bit weird, funny over here, doesn't it? You know, so like drug, medicine. You know, you kind of it's, you can't really tell. You know, like in Islam, like in ancient Islam, they started mental hospitals. I think about this a lot because my brother has schizophrenia, and. Um, they gave them, like, cannabis, you know. That's actually quite nice considering what, like, us lot were doing, like, putting them on ships and putting them in, like, torture zoos and stuff. Like, that's actually a nice thing. Yep. Hello, Megan. Hey, thank you. Thank you for your talk. Um, I would like to ask you if you can say a few if you think about the relationship between anthropocentrism and anthropomorphism, you pointed, Ooh, you yeah. pointed out the narcissistic yeah. act, act of, mm. of denying to be narcissistic. And what, what do you think about Lovely. it? OK, so um, there's a big worry among people who try to think about eco stuff that they, they're not, they, they, they don't want to anthropomorphize. It's like a thing I heard on the radio the, the other day, a scientist. You know, amazing, beautiful scientist. He was crying because he was describing a mother seal trying to feed him penguins because she was loving on him. Was she being penguin morphic at that point? In a funny way, she was, right? In a funny way, there's no problem in a certain way because she's being penguin morphic just as he's being anthropomorphic. Doesn't matter. But um, so anthropocentrism is not that. Anthropocentrism is, is believing that humans are special and different in some way that makes them really, really better or really, really worse actually, than, than other life forms, right? Um, anthropomorphism might be something I can't help doing in the following sense, right? Um, if, like me, you think that thinking isn't the only way to access things, right? That licking something or drinking something or, or ignoring something or doing a lecture about something that doesn't have any thoughts on it whatsoever is also a good way to, also just as valid a way to access things as thinking about them, right? then you're kind of saying that, like, first of all, you're saying that, like, snails, it can, it can in some weird way access something like the Mona Lisa by sliming them, because sliming is just as good as looking at or thinking about. And it's like, yeah, snails can do that too, yeah. You know, so that's part of it. Another part of it is that, like, you can't help doing it, right? Because if it's not just thinking, it's also, like, I'm anthropomorphizing this just by, like, holding it or by standing in front of it, right? And even by trying not to be anthropomorphic, like maybe there's a problem, which is that the attempt to avoid anthropomorphism is the most anthropomorphic thing you could possibly do. <laughs> do you see what I mean? And so since there's no escape, you might as well enjoy it a little bit and, and do a little bit of it and then realize that there's really no problem because if, 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 if licking and sliming are just as good, then the snail is snail pomorphizing my hand. Is it, is it like, like, like the tennis racket's tennis racket pomorphizing my hand? The beer can's beer can pomorphizing. The world isn't just this bunch of like things I can manipulate, and it's not like this, like a set of blank screens, which is like the modern version of that for like desire projection purposes. And like Western white people keep saying that it is. You know, because Hegel is supposed to be really intelligent and all that stuff. And, but like, I don't think so. I think actually humans are chameleons who can take on the colors of other things a little bit, right? Like you can actually, now we can notice that there are gravity waves. I find that's unbelievable, right? Like you put two lasers like that in Louisiana, you know, and then they, they vibrate and you record the vibration. I'm missing out a lot of the technical stuff here. Um, <laughs> And you subtract all the vibrations. You know the vibrations they had to subtract? This is in September, October of 2015. This really happened, guys. Like, there's no money to make CERN in America. But let's, so let's do a really cheap experiment. It's tens of millions, not billions, right? So it's expensive, but it's not expensive like CERN expensive. So, this, so there's this vibration for these lasers. And you subtract, you know, like the sound of cows walking across the cattle grid. That's actually a thing that you subtract. Like people having arguments in the corridor, they take that sound wave out, right? And, and like cars going past and tectonic plates going, you take everything out that you can think of, then there's a tiny little blip left. That must be a gravity wave. That's that experiment. And it totally, what's really odd is they switched on a more sensitive, more, 
nicely calibrated version of the lasers, and within 30 minutes, vroom, two black holes collided a thousand light years away and sent out this gravity pulse, right? And like everything on Earth, because gravity is amazing, it doesn't bounce off of stuff, right? It goes straight through it, right? And everything on Earth went bup, 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 for like a nanosecond. Everything got a little bit smaller, a little bit younger, a little bit taller, a little bit older, or whatever, just for like boom, 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 you know? And like somehow we can tune to that. And that's called scientist. But maybe scientist is like really super amplified artist. That's what I'm starting to think. Probably have time for one or two more. Lovely. Yeah. Um, this is a speculative question, um, and it may therefore be quite foolish. Good but, for you. Um, I think that we've come a little ways in thinking about animals as ourselves, mm -hmm. and ourselves as animals. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I'm wondering, number one, if you think that we can move toward thinking of ourselves as plants. Mm -hmm. And if we can mm. do that, mm. and we is yeah. the human species, right on. not limited just to the US yes. or China. Right. If we can, do you think that we'll ever have a language in common? Mm. Oh, see. Alice, Lovely. Alice talked to the plants. Yeah. But did she yeah. ever imagine that the plants could talk, might to, talk her. to her? Right, right, right. Um, I truly believe so. Yes. And here's why. Do you why. have any evidence that this might be a possibility? Well, I can't show you evidence because I'm not a scientist. And I, but what I can show you is a reasoning pathway that could point towards it, right? Because I think basically that, um, you know, language is kind of like be above and beyond like letters and words and stuff. It's like how we kind of like bring ourselves into being in some way, how we talk, how, how, how we are, right? Um, and usually when you think about that, you think of like a container, like I'm talking about this flower pot idea. You think of the human world as this very, very enclosed thing. Right? Like, and, you, and this is this concept of world, right? I'm very interested in this philosopher called Martin Heidegger. And it's very unfortunate because he sort of became a Nazi and it's sort of like all of the literary theory stuff, all the cool, interesting stuff, anything you use, any word you use with ality or icity after it is from that guy. It's, oh my God, I have to deal with this guy. But I think this Nazism is, is a re violent reaction to the truth of what he discovered, right? Um, and, um, and in part, a symptom of the, his reacting against it is this idea that world is really solid because it kind of, it can't be. Because world in this way is not like something that you're in, that you can point to on a map. World is something that you're into. That's what in means for him. It, it means stuff that you're into, right? Like I'm, I'm into persuading you. And that means that like there's some kind of future there and I don't know quite yet how that's gonna pan out. And so the world, the stuff that I'm into has got holes in it. By definition, it's perforated, right? So he has this thing where it's like humans are special because they've got this perfect flower pot world and German humans are really special because their flower pot world is made of titanium. Um, you know, and that's all just rubbish from his own point of view because what he's really saying actually is that humans have a perforated, tattered world. He, he calls it Veltarm, pouring world. Animals, which by which he means lizards and cats and everything, like have a kind of perforated world, right? And therefore also plants have a perforated world. There's no such thing as a thing that doesn't have one because like licking and brushing against and ignoring and stuff is also part of his thing. Right? And so growing over is also part of it, and so plants have a world, and all worlds are perforated. Therefore, all worlds can be shared. And this stupid rubbish about, you know, if a lion could talk, you couldn't understand what he said, which is what one philosopher said, like Wittgenstein, right? Can I even understand, look, here's, here's the proof of that. Can I even understand what I'm saying 90% of the time? I'll tell you, the, you, know, you obvious, it's actually a rhetorical question to myself, you know, no. You know, is, is, is the answer, right? I don't need to understand the lion 100%. I don't even understand myself 100%. 
I can share 30% of that lion's world. That's great. Then we can get on with like forging some links with each other. I can like share 20, 10, I don't know what percent of that plant's world. And this lecture was designed to make me do that, right? To like try and listen to plants inside my head because they're already me. They're not like over there. They're part of how I think, how I think. they're in my ear, you know? And just because I'm caring about them, they're right here in that funny phenomenology way. Like, your glasses are like the most far away things in the whole room, in a way, because you're looking at me and thinking about the words and stuff. Like, the thing on your nose is the furthest away phenomenologically, right? Now, visualize the black hole in the middle of the Milky Way galaxy. Yeah, it's called Sagittarius A. Sagittarius A is now in this room, right? The funny thing is that the hard, the most far away thing is this thing here, this thing that's doing this thing or trying to explain to you this thing, right? This is the furthest away, this thing called human being, right? And when I point to it, like, oh, it's really a white guy, really. Like, that's the last time we tried was in the Enlightenment and we had this idea that scratch the surface of anybody and you find this white guy underneath. It can't be that because it's this kind of thing that I, I'm not completely aware of, but I become aware of it by, by caring about other beings, actually. You know, and so I wrote, when I wrote this book, nowadays I like to write books that like, you can tell what it says from the title so you don't have to read it. You know? <laughs> and like, um, one of them's called e e Ecology Without Nature, sort of easy, yeah. And then, th and then this one's called Humankind, colon, Solidarity with Non-Human People, because that's what humankind is. Humankind, being human, is solidarity with non-human people. So yes, absolutely. I don't have the data, but definitely yes. Better than science, yes. Yeah. Hi. Um, in this uh, grouping of entities that uh, we've been talking about here, of mm -hmm. course, plants is central, um, partly because mm -hmm. we well, you f were forcing that in the conversation. But mm -hmm. animal, bacteria, viruses, people, mm -hmm. also stars, black holes, gravity waves, the sun. But uh, there's one entity that, although you laughed at it a couple minutes when you mm. talked about androids and chairs, there's mm. all of this other rock mm. and mineral, yep. non-living stuff that we yeah. make that's a part of our world. How does yes. how does how do rocks and minerals fit in? Well, with all of this. Okay, so one thing that's interesting is that most of the iron you use is actually like bacterial poop, right? Like the iron in Earth's crust is from bacteria, right? Like you're walking around, like if, you, if, you, if you're born in the south of England, you're mostly walking around on like seashells and stuff because that's what chalk is, right? Like a whole bunch of the top layer of earth, which is like, you know, when I say top layer, I mean, you know, going down several hundred feet, meters into the crust there, is, is life forms, actually. Like they, 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 they look like minerals and stuff, but actually they've somehow been secreted by, excreted by something, by, by life forms, right? So the, like, like the oxygen you're breathing is, is bacterial poop, right? So um, in one sense, these minerals aren't that different, right? And actually, that's an Aristotle thing again. You know, and the, 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 the not nice thing about Aristotle is he's always categorizing stuff, you know? Um, because like, he's, he's trying to show you what the point of these things are, you know, because he's got this idea that the, the form of a thing is the essence of a thing, and the form of a thing has a point or a telos, right? So like, he was Alexander the Great's tutor. This came in very handy, right? Like, Greeks are for invading barbarians. Barbarians are for becoming enslaved by Greeks. Great, you know. <laughs> um, and so what's really cool about Darwin is this blowing up this teleology, right? There's no point, right? It sounds horrid that there's no point. But when you really think about it, it's amazing. It's why stuff can happen at all. It's why we can have things being different and freedom and blah, 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 right? Um, and so I'm a bit loath to say that minerals aren't already in the conversation in a funny way, you know? I mean, you know, from a very crude point of view, I'm sort of made out of non-living things. So this life, non-life boundary is a bit suspicious. Like, actually, it's really hard for evolution science to like explain a single-celled organism. It can explain how that evolves into other stuff, right? But like, explain this thing, why? Because there's this concept of alive in there somewhere, because it's called biology, right? And it's based on this starting position, and you can't really question the starting position, 
you're there already, and then, and then you go, boom, analyze. Let's assume there are these things called life forms, and we'll assume roughly that they're not the same as like copper sulfate or something like that. Then you can never get from the copper sulfate to the life form, not really. You know? And so, but what if you know, being a cell, which basically means being a kind of semi-permeable sphere of some kind, had a lot to do with something like bubbles, you know, which had a lot to do with like ro how things rotate, like how chemicals rotate, which is that they've got like, 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 you know, like two magnets. When you put the same poles together, they repel each other. That's how an how a motor in a car, an electric car, works, right? Like, that's how rotation happens. That's how bubbles form in a way, right? So, like, this funny thing is that like maybe single-celled organism isn't strictly something that's alive rather than dead. Maybe it's better to say, and this sounds a bit spooky, but I think it's true, sort of undead. And maybe ecological awareness means being aware that of all these entities existing in a kind of flat plane where it's very hard to tell which one is conscious or non-conscious, which one is sentient, which one is not sentient, which one is alive and which one isn't alive, and even, from my crazy point of view, which one is existing and which one isn't existing, actually. And um, this idea of nature is this idea of the opposite, which is that I'm looking over there across a, a line of something that looks really different from me, like, like Blondie. You know, you know why she's called Blondie? Blondie? Blondie's called Blondie because of Hitler's dog. Hitler's dog Blondie, I'm saying. He's an Alsatian's over there, really different from me, right? And the reason why the Alsatian's different, actually, is because I've chucked. This line isn't a line. When I inspect it more closely, it's actually a valley. It looks like a line because it's foreshortened. But when I look into it, it's like all this racism and stuff has chucked all these beings that in, into this valley, uh, like, you know, non-human, inhuman, subhuman so-called beings. And therefore, it's kind of like wiped out the possibility of this, like this continuity between me and this dog or, or lion or whatever, right? So, like, that's the trouble with this nature concept. I'm ever so sorry. I always say the wrong thing in public. Like, I, I would prefer to say symbiosis or, or ec ecological coexistence or something like that, because nature implies stuff that isn't natural. It's, it's a normative, right? Like, nature means that some things aren't. You know, and there are all these things in this uncanny valley here that I've chucked in. Either, you know, whoever that is, you know, the, I'm pretending to be a Nazi right now. It's, it's working quite well. Okay, well, I think one more quick question. I was going to wrap up, but yeah. I realize I, I realize please. I favored this side. So why don't we do please, one quick? Please one? let not please let me not say I'm d performing being a Nazi quite well. Be the last thing that I say <laughs> on, on on YouTube. Yeah, okay, can we so, get it away from that? <laughs> so we don't end on that. You mentioned that you don't like the word nature. Can yes. you elaborate? Yeah. On that? Um, well, because nature is always this thing that's not me. It's over there somewhere. Like like, like it's underneath these clothes is nature. You know? Underneath the floor is nature. Over there in the mountains is, is nature. Somewhere in your DNA, but not on your surface, is, is, is nature. We, we, we use this word nature to mean something that isn't to here. So what's all this stuff then? Right? And then you try to define it. Said, well, it's rocks and trees and grass and blah, 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 blah. And then you realize, well, you know, since there's no outside to this, it's also like pollution and buildings and cars. And then it's like, well, if it's everything, then I, I can't really do anything with this idea. Right? Because actually, it's supposed to distinguish between natural and not natural, you know. And it's sort of like, why trust a word that you that's used on a cereal packet? <laughs> on that note. <laughs>